geek out with your fellow music nerds. Mark Goodman and Alan Light on Debatable. Volume Channel 106. We uh, yesterday did a roundtable in celebration of The Cure's disintegration. Roger O'Donnell from The Cure joined us by phone from England, uh, plus our our great roundtable here in studio. And apparently... Uh, Robert Smith was was listening and, and enjoyed the conversation. Was not able to make it and uh, wanted to to give us a call and and talk about the the record himself. A record that, uh, according to Q Magazine, a protracted wallow in the misery of love unrequited or recalled in hopeless desolation, which is a good thing, which was by a, the way. A breakthrough a breakthrough record in the United States market. It was it meant a hell of a lot to me. <laughs> it's been a massive week. I mean, on last weekend was the broadcast, the HBO broadcast of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction with The Cure's performance. Um, this week, the 30th anniversary of Disintegration. Also, the announcement that they would be simulcasting one of the the, the I final, guess the final of the Australia dates where they're playing Disintegration in full. So that will be there for everybody's consumption a bit later yeah uh, in, uh, in in the, the season so uh what better time to welcome robert smith to debatable hi robert hello hello thanks for uh for chasing us down and uh and, and wanting to join us yeah it's okay sorry i missed out yesterday but it was very entertaining listening to to roger he filled in really nicely how, how, he did okay. Tell me, tell me things I didn't even know. Well, <laughs> I was going to ask: Is there anything that that you were surprised to hear from Roger yesterday? <laughs> um, I'm never that surprised at anything Roger says. To be honest, it's uh, um, no. It's, it's interesting actually, I suppose, because the, the the thing surrounding disintegration, like Roger said, we've been in doing the um, we've you know we broke the back of the rehearsals for a week just to make sure that the show was going to work as I imagined it it should. And um, yeah, it just in the course of that, you kind of reminisce a little bit, and it's just very um, funny how everyone has similar memories, but um, you know, different enough for it to be interesting. <laughs> what are your memories? Um, we, we talked a little bit with Roger yesterday about what you know what we have have learned from from stories that we've read, interviews that you've done about your your frame of mind going into the album, about your your uh, feeling about uh, a, a year from from the release of this album turning thirty, etc. Does is but, that was that all crap? And of, and of course, so real? much so much of what he said is well, we played the tracks, yeah, but then we didn't know Robert went and wrote the songs and recorded the lyrics over that, so we didn't really know. Where it was, this record was going to go. Yeah, I, I think there were two things probably that m- m- obviously Roger probably um, wouldn't um, appreciate, maybe, and, and maybe the rest of the band wouldn't as much either. Was that um, the, first, the only thing that bothered me actually? Because the trilogy thing with pornography and um, disintegration and, and blood flowers, like kind of comprising a trilogy in my own mind, there, there were links between those three albums because I turned twenty for pornography and I turned. 30 for disintegration and 40 for blood mm. So for me, they were kind of milestones in, like, in as much as you tend to take stock. And, those, you know, they're kind of meaningless, really, I suppose. But you do tend to, you know, here I am, you know, and I've just turned 60 and I'm doing the same thing with this new album. I think it's just human nature. You kind of like look back over the, you know, the previous decade and think, <laughs> well, what was that all about? <laughs> but, um, you know, you, you just, you, th- you kind of start to try and, sum up where you are at that moment i think that's probably what i was doing with disintegration obviously we weren't all at the same age we weren't all doing that so it it was very particular to me at the time and i also realized through experience that i could only take you know you can only take so many people with you at one time you can't create a mood of you know the mood that i wanted to work in i couldn't create that for everybody that was around i mean it wasn't just a band there's people you know there's three or four people there's dave allen sitting behind the desk there's various other people working there there's also family and friends visiting and and generally it was a kind of a convivial atmosphere roger was right in that there was always a lot of laughter but i created a sort of a a space where there was no laughter and i think that maybe i was often the only one occupying that space so it may have gone unnoticed at times but and and it's very true that i i um up until the 2004 album I, i i never sang um, in the studio until I was happy with with how the track sounded because um, I was always singing along in my head but 
I don't know why I did it, really. I always used to save it because I wanted it to be like the big performance at the end. Somehow it made it more dramatic for me and it, and it just encouraged me to, to put in a performance. I used to think, like, this is it, you know, the, this is the song and I'm going to you know, perform. Um, I think if I'd been doing it constantly through the recording process, I might have wearied of it and, and maybe changed stuff. So I liked the idea of it being completely, you know, generally speaking, my vocal takes, they're, they, they're usually... I do three to five, and it's usually the third one that that's the master. So, and that's it. I very rarely go back and sing a song. And so it's, so it's that sense. There's that sense of performance. I think that I wanted to keep. And if, and but the, the you know the trade-off, as Roger said yesterday, was that the rest of the band were unaware of what the songs were about. So, you know, but but also having said that, it's nice to be able to try and create atmosphere and mood with pieces of music because that's essentially what I was trying to do with dis- disintegration. I was trying to make it more cinematic and. And evoking emotions. That's why I left, you know, two or three minutes before I started singing to create that that mood, and then hopefully I'd capture it in the lyrics. So, ah, it's a, it, that's that's the, those long intros. But it, yeah. but it's an interesting yeah. challenge, as you say, to create for the band because I think we all think, oh, they're going to play to the moods and to the themes that he's singing about, and you know that's what they're they're trying to capture within what each instrument is doing. But this is well, you know, I, I, disconnected. Often, I would I would give people like a you know. T- words or like a line or i'd say you know this song is about you know i kind of trying to set the mood but generally speaking if you're playing something at a slow bpm and it's gonna and it's lasting seven minutes and it's like and i'm putting thunder claps in at the beginning you're getting an <laughs> idea of what the, the mood's gonna be and I, mean, I chose the studio because it was remote um we, i wanted to record you know i pushed the recording back to later in the year when i knew it was going to be miserable so i was just kind of setting a, a you know i was creating an environment and a, and a knowing what I wanted to come out of the end of it. So I wasn't any more particularly morose during that period than I, <laughs> than I ever am. Um, but I wanted to draw that out of myself and also out of everyone around me. I just wanted us to create something that had that feeling. It's a kind of universal um, feeling of melancholy. It wasn't specific to me at that time. It wasn't like yesterday, it was like my state of mind and things. I mean, I just got married. I was deliriously happy. Right. In, in, for most of the time, and we did have a fantastic summer. You know, the band had so much fun that summer, and um, because everything had kind of worked out. You know, we, it was ten years since we kind of started out, for, you know, properly with the, and um, and everything was was going pretty well. You know, and, and so to an outsider, we're like, why on earth would we be creating these really like doom and gloom songs? But um, it's it's often been a way with us that there's a the more miserable the music, the happier the band. I don't know how it works. <laughs> generally, how it works. Funny how you managed to perfect that balance. Yes, um, so you many people see the band when we're playing pop songs. <laughs> more miserable, miserable, band miserable, band miserable <laughs> bastards. Um, so so many people talked to I me. Mean, you heard it yesterday when we had Laurie and Lindsay talking about it, and some of the the comments that we were getting from people who look at disintegration as such a landmark you know such a transformative uh sort of an album for you what does it you know what does what does that one represent does it represent a a, a real shift or a a move into different territory or you know is it, is there a reason that it continues to sort of occupy that space in people's imagination um i think there are a number of reasons i, th- I don't think it was a shift personally i, I think that um, there are songs on the Kiss Me album, the preceding album, which signify what was coming next. It's just, I could have kind of gone in a number of different directions, I think, because the Kiss Me album had a whole load of stuff on it. You know, it kind of ran the gamut from, you know, out and out, kind of like pop music, like Why Can't I Be You and, and stuff like that, right through to things like um, A Thousand Hours, which mm. is a really kind of downbeat and quite, you know, very, very melancholic song. So uh, I, I, I just thought it would be more interesting. I also just felt like I wanted to do the bigger, more cinematic, the, the soundscapes and the, the more epic kind of like songs. I didn't really want to do any more pop stuff. I thought I, I thought maybe, you know, looking back, that maybe I thought it was a way of kind of like almost pushing back against the success that we were getting without actually being out and out against being successful. Because of course I wanted everyone in the world to listen to us. But I felt that we were running the risk of somehow being diluted by... Which is alluded to yesterday, funny enough. But yeah. But by becoming more successful, you do you do tend to lo- you know you're in danger of losing something very important at the heart of the band. Um, I think also personally, I was driven by the fact that I felt like the pornography album, which I, like I said I'd done when I just turned twenty, 
I thought was I, I'd achieved something that was I thought without that if that's the only album I, I remember for it was a great album I really loved it I was really proud of it I mean I, I was proud of all of them but in that one in particular I thought I've actually managed to capture exactly what I can hear in my head um, and I think with Disintegration I wanted to try and do the same so I, I kind of I, I forced myself to to enter this sort of you know this this state of mind whereby I was trying to cr- I, I personally was trying to create something which would be memorable I know that the rest of the band and like Roger was saying it was just making it I wasn't just making another album you never go into the studio thinking we'll just make another album you'd be insane but um, and, as, and I think because Roger had no uh, reference point really because as he said it was his, the first album really that he'd ever pl- played on so you know it was a um, it would be a shock actually because it was kind of mental some of the stuff in those days that we used to get up to so um, not all albums are made like Disintegration was made <laughs> um, but it was a uh, I don't know. That's what I mean at the start of saying this. The, the difference in perspective is slight, but quite meaning, meaningful, really, in, in how each one of us who was there remembers it. You know, we all remember it ever so slightly differently. It, it is interesting that, you know, you make a record and all of us who listen wind up attaching our own moments to it, but of course you have yours. Mm. Uh, I, I wonder how you feel uh, about turning 60. <laughs> Oh, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> well, I mean, just to finish the, the, the thought about the, uh, the reasons why I think disintegration, apart from the fact that I think it's a very, it, it, it works as a piece, you know, mm-hmm. as an album in that, that sort of format. It, it just works. It's, it's put together really well, and apart from anything else. Mm-hmm. It just kind of flows, and, it, and it's, there are good songs on it, and it just, the sound works. The whole thing hangs together, and it takes you somewhere for it, you know, which is a sign of a good album, I think. Um, also, a lot of it was to do with where we, where the band had, you know, the point that we'd reached in 1989, the generation that we were playing to, who have gone on to, you know, who have gr- kind of grown older with us, and and we held on to a lot of those people because of disintegration, because people kind of trusted us in some way, or most trusted our, us emotionally, and I think that's why it has so much resonance now. For you know, the fact that it's caught on with the younger and younger, you know, the younger generation as as the years have gone by is a, is a bonus. I I never could have imagined that would happen i was kind of making the album for you know in that moment i wanted it to appeal universally and i thought i hoped that people would listen to it down the years but i didn't really expect them to um so that's a, that's really, i think all those things they kind of that sometimes you're just in the right place at the right time and i think with the band at that in that particular period we would just we'd, we'd become just one of those bands you know so um we could have made this integration 10 years later and i don't think anyone would have taken any notice um so it's not just about the, the songs, and it's not just about the lyrics, and just about the sound. I think it's also to do with when it happened, and um, mm. well, what it happened. And, and alternative music was kind of it was something that was it was suddenly kind of emerging. It was becoming mainstream, and and all those things kind of like add, added together. And yeah. I mean, you say uh, that that it's in the moment, but one thing that we that we did talk about yesterday a bit was how something like love song has become you know almost a modern standard. Um, covered so much and, and used so much and showing up. I mean, clearly, some of these things are things that, that transcended that moment and have connected uh, at other yeah. times as well. Um, yeah, I think um, the, the, it, was, it was right, actually, yesterday, whoever said it, that it was slightly out of whack with the, what was on the rest of the album. But I did want something. I just wanted some some light on there. Because I, I was talking with that, I remember the, one of the, one of the um, running orders, had one of the B-sides on and didn't have Love Song because I felt for a brief moment, maybe a day or two, that perhaps this was compromising the album. It was too much. It was too happy. <laughs> so, but I'm glad that I had to I rethought that and, um, and, and stuck it on because I think it actually throws the other songs into starker relief, actually. I think it works really well where it's placed on the album. It's because if you feel what you're losing by the fact that that song's kind of there in the beginning, there's a sudden sort of second flush of hope and then it's all kind of it's taken snatched away, away from snatched you away. again. Yeah. <laughs> but it is odd actually hearing um, some of the, you know, some of the verses you were, you were referring to yesterday. Of, uh, and that's true of any of our songs. I always kind of like, it makes me jump when I hear other people singing our songs. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I suppose it's a very simple song. That's that's probably, uh, the, the, you know, why it was popular. It, it's really, really simple. It's like Boys Don't Cry in that respect. It's mm-hmm. just a comp- you know, really, really simple song. Um yeah, what's it like turning sixty? I, I can't believe I have actually. I'm still in denial. <laughs> I, 
Yeah. Well, that's that's that is the the question. You know, I only and I mention it not because I think sixty is old, but rather because it's it's how you react to it, and and in addition to that, what it is that you have picked up over these years. You are you still kind of averse to success? It seems not that you've come to terms with whatever that might mean for you. Yeah, I, I don't think I was ever really averse to success. I was just aware of the the dangers of it. I think because the I was lucky in in, in in a funny way, because the band took quite a few years to, you know, we we kind of got more successful incrementally, and like year on year, it was a slow process. The first five or six years of the band was really manageable. I mean, at times, I, I you know, I was very frustrated because I couldn't understand why we weren't kind of playing to more people than we were. But but with hindsight, it was great because it meant I went around the world a few times and I did all I wanted to do, and I and we played music to people, and I learned about how it all worked, and I enjoyed you know meeting people and seeing things and in a way that when you're famous you can't you really can no longer do that very easily and so when success came i was able to cope with it more but we actually reached a, po- a level of success which i could never have dreamed that we that we'd reached because i knew that we would never compromise and so i thought well you know we're never going to be playing stadiums because that that isn't what happens to a, a band like the cure so when it did i thought i was prepared for it but i actually wasn't and i think i kind of uh, um, certainly the wish which followed we were still at that level when we were playing stadiums on that tour and I I thought that had something of a, of a breakdown I think because I thought I can't just keep doing this it was just a, it was dehumanising to such a degree that I, I found it certainly coming back off the wish tour a couple of years after the disintegration tour I, it took me months to, to get back to any kind of what I call normal which isn't even normal <laughs> <laughs> so, and so I realised that it was taking me longer and longer to become, you know, to get back to how I, you know, I feel comfortable with myself. And it's, um, I didn't think it was a price worth paying, really. So, and the, the band, um, luckily, really, that um, Boris and Paul left after that tour, and the band kind of uh, imploded, and we had a couple of years of inactivity. So, but that allowed me to, to just think about what, you know, what I was doing, why I wanted to do it, and I did, went off and did some other things, which were banal and actually very fulfilling. And then came back at it and. Was you know ever since then I think I think about what we do in a slightly different way. I think at the, in some ways that career trajectory from like seventy nine the first album through to the Wish album ninety two, the you know disintegration of the Wish with the two sort of like big albums. I think things were different after that. I no longer want and I didn't feel like I wanted to achieve that. I'd never felt competitive again after that. Uh, up to that point, I think particularly as a younger person, you have to have that competitive. That, that, that feeling that you want to beat other people, you want to be better than other people, you know, which is why I think another point about yesterday's discussion, we did play the game up to a point because we were doing, you know, shows like Top of the Pops and stuff because I realised that if we didn't do it, someone else would do it. They weren't going to cry, they were going to tear their hair out if I turned it down. So I used certain parts of the game in order to get us to where I felt we should be, but... But, you know, we didn't do national television. We didn't do that kind of stuff too much, you know, certainly not in America, because I was always very aware that we... I wanted us to be alternatives. That was the whole point of the band, you know. I wanted us to be something different. Um, And so we couldn't really go and compete with people on their playing field. We had to create our own, and that was really what I was trying to do. So having said all that, what is it to go back, um, you know, to go back to this record, 30 on this this 30th anniversary and try to reconnect with it i mean is this about trying to get yourself back into the mindset that you were in when this record got made or do you come to these songs in a different way and you know maybe to express something different when you when you're doing them now well a lot, a lot quite a lot of them we've have stayed in the main set you know in the in the pool of kind of like 30 40 50 songs that we draw on um when we play live um Certainly, like pictures of you. You know, there are certain songs which I think a, a, an audience would be they would be sad if we didn't play those songs. So, Lullaby is another one. Um, love song. I, I really right. enjoy, it. and they, I really enjoy singing them. I really enjoy playing and singing those songs. We, we've the last tour we did in 2016, the big tour that we did. We alternated. You know, every sort of third night we opened with playing song and finished with disintegration. So they you know, I'm I've been singing those songs since the album came out. Um, a few of them have dropped out, a few of them have kind of been relegated to that, and, and a few that we'll be playing um, later in the month, uh, we've never played before. A few songs from that time 
never became songs. I mean, that we I've dug up some old stuff, and it's a, it's funny. The rehearsals are quite funny because Roger was right. We like looking at each other and thinking, really, <laughs> I don't remember ever playing this. So. Um, it is when you commit <laughs> when you commit to that full album thing. Yeah. It does mean there's something you may have not played since you left it in the studio. Yes, there, there are. There will be some things. There. So the the beauty of it is no one is going to know that we're playing it wrong. <laughs> well, if you're playing it, it's right. <laughs> that's how it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the spirit. <laughs> so, um, is there uh, w- when you look at this, you're going to play this album in its entirety on uh, in Sydney? But uh, are you going to do that anymore? Is there any other dates on this tour where you will do that whole thing? Well, and, and what does that mean to you? The, the it, year, the, 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 the rest of the year is is it's kind of weird because. My time has been taken up, like the last few weeks, um, I've been finishing off the film with Tim Pope of the Hyde Park show that we did last year, which was actually the anniversary of the very first show that The Cure played. It was the 40th anniversary show. So we played in Hyde Park in London, we filmed it, and, and it just, actually today, I've just signed off on it. So that's going to be a cinema release in, at, in sometime in the summer like a global cinema release. So it's another piece of nostalgia, but it's actually, it's such a good show. I think like this, you know, I just wanted it to be known. It's like, it's a, it's a legacy piece really. And Tim's done a fantastic job with it. It looks absolutely amazing and it sounds great. Even I say so myself. Um, so I, I'm, I'm juggling my time with doing that and also trying to finish a new album. So it's a very weird you know, I'm kind of my head caught between time zones, right? All the way back and all the way forward. Yeah. Yeah. So I also am very. I don't really want to um, dedicate the rest of the year to celebrating something which happened 30 years ago. I would much rather celebrate what we're doing now. So the idea of the global stream of disintegration was really to give me a bit of an out in case I decide that we're not going to do it again. Because I figure that you know it will be on there and it will be on demand and stuff. It will be there for a while. So anyone that you know, you can kind of set up a decent system. If you've had enough notice, put some nice speakers, plug some nice speakers and turn it up. Um, I know it's at the wrong time for some people. I find well, it weird when you say... tough for America. Three, <laughs> three in the morning, you just stay <laughs> yeah. up late. Come on. It's not that big a deal. Well, it's three no, in the morning in L.A. Yeah. It's 6 a.m. in New York. <laughs> Get up early. That's, <laughs> that's like tea time. Come on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I, so for me, that was, you know, it, I thought, Apart from the fact I thought it would be nice for people to see it, because obviously even if we do do it again, we're not going to be going around the world playing the disintegration show, because it would be slightly odd, I think. Um, but yeah, I've got some some ideas of how we can incorporate it into something, some of the things that we might do later in the year. But like I say, I've, I'm the closer I get to finishing something new, the more excited I get about it, and the, the more I want other people to be excited by it, rather than, you know... You, do, you get what I'm saying, don't you? Yeah, it's, yeah sure. So it's, a, it's a bit of a balance in that, really. So I'm really pleased that the attention is on disintegration and, because it deserves it, and, I, and I'm really proud of it, like I said. But I would hate it if, by, uh, you know, come Christmas, that's all I'm still talking about. Mm-hmm. I would think I would go mad. So. Well, um, did we he, do we have some sort of release date? I mean, maybe the new record's going to come out around Christmas or, or sooner. Um, it, will, it will be out for Christmas, or I will... I don't know what I'll do. Some kind of like, I won't even say. So, um, yeah, I, I. I mean, what's what's the status of the record now? Are you are you you're in final mixes or where where are you at? Um, I need to. It's it's at a point where I need to sing some of them because they're very. There are a couple of really long songs. That there's a couple of like ten minute songs, and without some kind of vocal performance and structure. So it's a kind of halfway house. Like I said before, I never sing. This time I'm going to have to sing a couple of the songs because otherwise I can't, I can't utilize. Particularly something like we've, we've got Reeves in the band, Reeves Good Barrels, and I want yeah. to 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 use him, you know, to, in in a way that maybe he hasn't been used so much. He's such a fantastic guitarist and so versatile. I mean, he's, he's he has a sound, but he's also incredibly adaptable as he's proven through the years that he's been playing with us. And I want to use that, you know, what he's learned, I suppose, what I think he's learned about playing in The Cure. And I think the best way to do it, because he plays around, because he's played Bowie in particular, he plays around the vocalist, and, and he's brilliant at doing it. And so in order to get the best out of him, I really need to be the vocalist. So I need to put some vocals on some of the songs to allow him to really perform. Um, you know, the, 
drums, bass, the, the six string basses, all that kind of stuff. The, a lot of the keys, the basic songs are there. I, I'm I need to put some vocals on, so um, you, which is why what I'm supposed to be doing tonight. <laughs> you mentioned these, you know, ten minute songs and lengthy. I mean, those were Roger yesterday was using. He said epic. epic. Massive. Yeah. Those were the kind of words that he was using. Is that uh, you know a, a reasonable way to characterize these these songs? Yes. My my only dilemma at the moment is to is getting a running order that works. I've gone through so many different running orders. My favorite running order is so utterly bereft of hope. It's so morose. <laughs> <laughs> I played, did... <laughs> played it to a couple of people whose opinions I value, and they just look at me and think, you know, <laughs> it's so dismal in, in a really good way. But it's just in, it's just relentless, and it's like kind of four, four, forty. My my favourite under is about forty-seven minutes of just relentless kind of doom and gloom. I realise that you know, like, probably to make it slightly more interesting, in the same way the pornography had. Strange Day on it and, and Disintegration has got Fascination Street and yep. Lullaby it manages to you know the, the best albums manage to have a sound and a character and, and, and create an atmosphere and a mood but, but they're allowed, you're allowed to play within that and, and that's just what I'm struggling a little bit with so I think we're going to have to go back in and do another song I have, we, we didn't do one of the demos that I'd written because I thought it wouldn't, it wouldn't work and I actually think the album needs just something ever so slightly off kilter to make the rest of the songs work a bit bit better. So it's it's weird. We haven't done it for ten years. I kind of I've fallen out of practice of you know <laughs> how you do this, <laughs> how to put it together. Yeah. yeah. So the individual songs, the fantastic. It's, but now I'm faced with like how do I turn this into something which is a a piece. You know? And the other thing we do need to ask is Roger had said that from you know his perspective he felt like this could be the the final Cure album. Uh, well, he was very careful to say nice things about me, wasn't he? Just in case he isn't. <laughs> I, don't, I can't. I can't gauge, you know, where that falls on his on the on the usual spectrum. Yeah. But uh... no, um, I don't know. He was right. I mean, I, I tell everyone that around me that whatever we're doing is the last time we're going to do it. I have. I never think about. You know, I'm not one of those people that thinks like this album's going to be great, but the next one's going to be even better. <laughs> um, this is, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, this is it. But I've gone into every every album thinking this is it. Um, and not glibly, I actually think, yeah, this is it. It's, you know, this is it. Me. As I, I don't have really in, in this format, in the Cure format, I don't have any anything more to say, and I'm going to move on to something else. Well, if I'm honest, I think we've already recorded two albums worth of stuff. So I mean, it's either going to be a double album, or there's already two albums made. If I can get the words and the singing done, um, so it won't be the last Cure album. I, <laughs> you know, it's not something that I can't really think like that. I, mm. I suppose because I I, I don't. I can't. I've given up projecting into the future because everything goes wrong when you do that. Everything goes wrong when you don't. But um, <laughs> <laughs> he's learned like, a few things. Plan, he's learned a few things plan, over the years. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the 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 four thirteen dream album, which is the like we did that more than ten years ago. I went into the studio intent on creating a double album with instrumentals, and I had the whole thing mapped out. I had every song had a piece of A4 paper stuck on the wall, and it ran around the wall, and there was like twenty six songs. And I wasn't allowed to, I didn't hold, I was too tired by the end of the project to really hold my ground. And I caved in and allowed it to be a single album, all vocals. And it wasn't as good as it should have been. It wasn't as good as it could have been. It would have been a fantastic double album. People would have reacted to it very differently. Things, it may not have changed anything at all, actually, in, in historically over the last 10 years, because it's been a good 10 years anyway. But I would have felt happier about it. And um We've actually got, there's a whole album left over from that session, which I think I'll probably put, I don't know, I'll do some kind of luxury, deluxe edition of it. I was supposed to be doing that for its 10th anniversary, but I think I missed it. (laughs) (laughs) There'll be a a 15. Deadlines, you may have noticed. (laughs) So, Robert, we kind of need to take a break here. Can we hang on to you for a couple of minutes? Still want to ask you a bit about the the Hall of Fame. Yeah. can yes, you? okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Re- well, re- redress the balance, you mean? <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> yes, I'm indeed. I just have a quick beer and put on my happy face. Anyway. <laughs> We're talking with Robert Smith, and we've got more to come after these words. Stand by. <laughs> One of my favorite bass lines of all time. Killer. Welcome back to Debatable. We are on the phone right now with The Cure's Robert Smith. 
We've been talking uh, a bit about the upcoming new record and uh, also about our celebration yesterday, our roundtable celebration yesterday, 30th anniversary of disintegration. Uh, Robert, it's, thank you once again for, for hanging with us through the commercial break. We uh, uh, America just got a chance to see the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction this past weekend. And so everyone got to see what, for many of us, was one of the great moments that night, which was you walking on stage and the, the, the room going bananas, a standing ovation. And I... I was uh, amazed and, and so moved watching you. Can you sort of relate sh- what that moment sure, was to it you? It sure seemed like this was, you know, hitting you and, and registering pretty powerfully. Yeah, it did. I, I mean, because we hadn't um, decided for a number of reasons to, to to attend or play until, you know, a couple of weeks before, um, I think tickets had been on sale, and I pretty much imagined that most of the tickets had sold. So I didn't really think that there would be that many Cure fans in the audience. Hmm. And I didn't think we'd get any kind of response from... Um, I mean, that being horrible, like the, the, more, the industry floor, the people at the tables. Although there were a lot of artists there, and, 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 and you know, obviously I'd hope that they would appreciate what we do. Um, but yeah, I was taken aback, to be honest, at um, the, the warmth. And the strength of the reception. It was. Um, it felt like a kill show. That's <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny, well, Alan. You you, know, you point yeah, out like I, every. I, I thought it was for you know it was. That's never going to happen again. Even I wish that everyone had been there. I wish the whole thirteen was could have been up there. But yeah. It's never going to happen again. And it was. It was. Um, <clears throat> it was for the band, you know. It was for what the Cure have done, and I appreciated that. I thought it was a really great moment. Moment. Were were, were you? What was your take on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to begin with? I, w- some of the British artists that we've worked with who have been inducted aren't exactly clear on on how big a deal it is. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I, because of my nature, I kind of find out about things, and so I know a lot more about it probably than than some of the others in the band. Mm-hmm. So, I, and and over the years, I have re- appreciated what it means, particularly in it, it, maybe exclusively in America. I mean, it means so much more in America than it does anywhere else. It means, as Roger said yesterday, it doesn't register at all over here. The funny thing is it, it now has, because of that ridiculous um, interview seg- segment, but um, that's oh. another thing. Entirely. Oh, gosh. I mean, are you as excited <laughs> as I am? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that thing. But the, the actual, the actual um, institution, I suppose... I don't know whether it's a cultural thing. It's just, I suppose, there's a kind of like a bristling at the, at the self-appointed nature of it. I suppose that as it's progressed, I think, through the years, and I've watched it kind of grow, um, it's become, I suppose, m- more legitimate, for want of a better way of putting it, because because the people that are in it, once they start voting themselves, it becomes more real. I think when it started out, it was pretty much a vanity project. I think it would be very hard to, to defend that, you know, against that accusation. But... That's not necessarily always a bad thing, you know. It's it's a, a pejorative way of putting it, but I think that as more and more artists are, in, are involved in it and are involved in the voting process, and the whole thing kind of changes its character a little bit. And I think it's that I suppose that I was struggling to recognise at first. But I think that my my judgment was slightly coloured because of the, the slight standoff that I had about inducting all 13 members of the band. I just it's just something I've had since I was about five years old. If people tell me something like what to do or why, and they don't explain why, I get really agitated. And all I wanted was, you know, a reason why. Why are these three being excluded while the other, you know, the rest of us are being included? And and I didn't really get a coherent answer, but I thought, well, is it worth taking a stand? You know, I knew that Andy Anderson was really ill, and I didn't think he would die before the ceremony, but... I did know that he was very well, and I knew it would mean a great deal to him, and I think it was that that was really upsetting me. So, um, but in, in the end, I, I kind of figured, well, there are, there are um, better battles to fight hmm. than this one. Mm-hmm. And, um, and once I committed to it, you know, one, we, we talked about it an awful lot, and I think, like Roger said yesterday, I've never been so indecisive in my life about something to do with the band. I normally just have a gut reaction. I go, yeah, this is what we're going to do. No, that's what we're not going to do. In this instance, I went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it was just one night in the studio, we were sitting around and I was saying, no, we really do have to decide, you know, because we've got two weeks. We can't just, like, decide the night before. And um, 
I think Simon said, um, if we don't do it, um, no one will know what we could have been like. You know, right. if we do it, people right. will know what we can do. And that, I thought, it's that, actually, it's that simple. So that's why I said we'd do it. And once we'd all agreed, you know, OK, let's go and do it, then we're going to do it as well as we can. So I think where I diverge a little bit from what Roger was saying yesterday is that um, I think he's been a bit disingenuous because the whole band loved it. You know, it, was, it would be absurd for, to do something like that and not enjoy it. You know, it would be almost yeah. impossible. You're getting on stage, you're playing music to people and they're reacting. It's like, that's what we do. It's, it was a great night. It was lovely seeing... Um, I hung out the whole night with uh, Boris and Harry. That was mm-hmm. fantastic. So I haven't seen him for such a long time. And, uh, yeah, I just had a really, you know, it was a really great few days in New York. Listen, I think what, you know, what what's the thing that you realise in, in some ways is what a moment like that means for the fans. I mean, means for those who really want to see you there, who really want to see you included in an institution like that, and to, you know, to give them that moment. Yes, although I would say that um, I felt that there, there was... That I've read, I don't know, I wouldn't bother going into it, but that somehow it vindicates people who say, like, yes, we were right all along. And I think that was alluded to yesterday as well. I don't actually go along with that, because I think the whole point of liking a band like The Cure is that you don't need vindication from other people. That's surely at the heart of, of alternative music. You you like something because you like it. It doesn't matter if it's recognised by other people, by your peers, or by anyone. You can't be told what's good or what's bad. So that part of the sort of the idea that we would somehow vindicate, I don't really buy into that. I, I really appreciate the fact that we've been inducted, and I'm very proud that we're alongside some of the people who are my musical heroes. But I don't feel it vindicates fans or, indeed, the band. I think it's just an... Um, I don't know what the word would be. It's, it's just it's great to be involved with it, and it's great to be inducted. But um, I think perhaps it, this is where the, the British perspective and right. the American perspective <laughs> diverge. I think it's at this point because I think it, in, culturally in America it means so. Like I've said it means so much more um, for an English person or British person. It's it's hard but, to take that step. Right, right. You know what I mean? It's like you, you just you just can't do it mentally. You can't do it. I, I don't know. That, Anyway. So, but so, it was, it was, everyone smiled the, the entire time. So that's, um, you know. Which was, which was charming to, to, to witness. It was. And, and, and Trent's, and, and ex- Trent's, and Trent's introduction was, so was, yeah. was fantastic. Yeah. I Did mean, you... that's, that's the other thing. Being, in, um, being inducted by Trent, as soon as they, you know, I was told that he, he was going to be, you know, we were, there was a kind of a couple of names floated about. But I mean, I've known him for, for years and years. And he's such a fantastic artist in his own right. The fact that we were being inducted by someone like that also made it incredibly special. So, yeah, I mean, it's just great. The whole thing was re- really good. You know, everyone was really nice. Everyone was friendly. There was not, you know, everyone is kind of doing the same thing. Everyone's trying to to do the same thing. They're doing it in different ways. But also everyone, um, you know, I don't know. I, <laughs> it was just, it was fun. I mean, it's actually a very memorable um, night. And it was, the icing on top was the... Was the, I mean, I, you know, obviously I don't understand what going viral means because I'm a Luddite, but um, <laughs> it, it, it made me laugh because I thought this is the moment when we're inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and all the things that we've done, all the things that we're celebrating, and that was the thing that everyone sort of like, the next day, it's like I got, I've never had so much attention from people I haven't spoken to for like <laughs> decades. You know, it's like, it's crazy. I was in London in the studio and people who I've known for more than like 25 years are asking for selfies I start, <laughs> what's going on it's, cab drivers are asking for my autograph I haven't signed an autograph for a cab driver in 30 years, it's like, the whole thing is totally absurd it's, it's like I'd entered some kind of twilight zone for about 48 hours, it was utterly bizarre but, but yeah it was great I mean, I, that, even that moment I just thought it was, I wasn't, you know there's a funny moment when I watched it, when I looked at it in the airport, because someone showed it to me and said, oh, God, there's like, like, hundreds of thousands of people looking. And I can see, in, as a very slight pause, because what I was, I'm glad I didn't say what I was going to say. <laughs> but, um, which was? Very momentarily, in order to think of something which wasn't going to be offensive in the slightest and very neutral, and that was what came out. Was just, you know, just my, and I fell back on my I know, dryness, I suppose. <laughs> It's a good. It's a lesson. It's a lesson learned. That's yeah. that's what served you in the moment. Um, so just so this week you announced the uh, the Austin City Limits uh, mm. 
date was announced as the first uh, festival appearance in the states um are 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 more u.s dates kind of imminent is that are we going to hear soon on those plans um we'll be announcing another one later this month which is a will be a really special one actually because we're um, curating it so it's going to be on the west coast but there's about there'll be about 10 other acts all hand-picked so it's going to be um I just wanted to do something a bit like Hyde Park, bit something a bit celebratory and just, uh, you know, just you know, so it isn't going to be a disintegration show. I'll be very, very clear about that, but it's going to be just a celebratory show with a load of um, artists who are just uh, in their own right all deserve to headline festivals. So it'd be, I think that curating the Meltdown Festival a couple of years ago yeah, in London yeah. has, has given me the taste for curation. <laughs> I really enjoy putting uh, the bill is. It's such a great... I can't wait for it to be announced because it's such a great bill. Um, and we'll just be a great, you know... I mean, it might be a, a, a weekend. I'm not sure yet. It might just be a, a one-off. I yeah, I was just going to say, is it? are we talking one day or a two-day thing? Well, I'm or? not sure how it's going to work quite yet because I'm just nailing, you know, tying up the loose ends and nailing it down. But it's... Um, Can you say yeah, what, what means, town it'll be in? Um, it'll be in and around L.A. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't because it was, it's going to be slightly too late in the year. I think to we were trying to get somewhere in New York that was a, like an outdoor kind of you know, to have the right kind of vibe, but um, it fell through unfortunately. So, but we're already talking about what we're going to do coming back to America next year. But I want to do something with the with new songs. So I want to bring a new show to America rather than you know do something nostalgic. We so if we end up playing the disintegration show, we'll end up playing the disintegration show at some point somewhere. But if we don't, it doesn't matter. Just watch the live stream. <laughs> Just watch the live stream. That's there for everybody. Yeah. Um, <laughs> turn, the, turn the lights down. Turn it up. Watch the live stream. And, and with the, you said with the uh, the, the Hyde Park uh, film, you know, now fully to bed. Um, now the album is going to be the the full focus for you. Yeah. If, if we would let him get off the phone, <laughs> we've only got like about what we've got a week. I've got one week to do. Yeah, it's not going to happen, but I'll try. Because we're going to re- find a rehearsal in a week's time for the for the, the Vivid Festival shows in Sydney. So I'm, I'm slightly running out of time, but it's okay. I'm travelling by bus around Europe, so I've got lots of days on the bus where I can. So if you hear like droning bus noises, be like, <laughs> neat song. maybe that's the, that's the theme that will hold it all together. Could be the could be the next big thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, one final question, completely sort of in another area. Um, I think that there's probably a lot of people, myself included, who would love for you to to sit down and focus on a memoir. Is that something that you would ever consider? Um. I have considered it, yeah. I mean, I've been approached a few times over the last couple of years in particular, um, as this, this anniversary has been and gone. The um, I've digitised, or with the help of a couple of people, who've digitised everything that The Cure's ever done since, you know, cine film mm-hmm. in the mid, you know, right in 1976, I think it's the first bit of footage of the, the, sort of the, the nascent band of, of young teens uh, <laughs> playing very badly on the school stage um, and all that's been done so I'm kind of up to about I think we're heading into the 2000s now with just a, with, so everything's digitised anyway but just putting it all together and so at some point maybe next year I was going to narrate the story of the band and whether that because I'd rather, I don't really want it to be a memoir I'd rather it be a like my version of what the band is and why it's done what it's done and how it's done what it's done. I don't feel any great rush to do it because I want to include what we do next in it. Well, um, after all, you're only 60. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like an on, you know, it's still ongoing. So I'm not in a in a, any hurry. Um, I don't really like memoirs, to be honest. I particularly hate memoirs that are written by people who still like still only halfway through their career, like I am. You can you can, <laughs> there you you can do you can do more than one, you know. <laughs> I have to say that. Yes, uh, indeed. Um, 
Robert, Robert. Uh, it's it's been wonderful speaking with you. We will we'll let you get back to complete this record. <laughs> yes, get to, get to work, my friend. Yes. I, I forgot. I, so, I, I know I'll upset some of you. The um, the meltdown thing that we did, the show that we did last year as well, the, the complimentary yeah. piece of the Hyde Park show, that's going to come out. We, I finished that this week because so, I've been doing them in tandem with two different with Tim and Nick Wickham is doing the meltdown thing. So that's sort of the other side of the band. It's like in the Royal Festival Hall in London, and it's and it's. Very much, you know, stuff that's like is fan-driven kind of stuff, and and the two are coming out at side by side as a kind of like anniversary piece, and it's um, it's really good actually. I, I just I know I say that I don't actually say that. I normally don't self-promote. But, um, <laughs> you can, if you say it, we you believe can you. Say it, it's done. It's all right. <laughs> Robert, thank you so much. Thank you again um, for, for chasing us down and wanting yes. to uh, wanting to, to catch us up with all of this. And thank you for listening to the show. <laughs> yeah, it's my pleasure. It really is. It's good. We good will. Time. Please continue. We'll do, you have the number. Feel free to check back we'll, with us whenever you like. We'll do it again soon. I wouldn't say that lightly, you know. After I've had another couple of beers, I might be phoning you back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, drunk dial us any time, Robert. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Smith, thank you again. Thank you, Robert. See you soon. Bye. Cheers. All right, we got to take a break real quick, and we will be right back on the other side. All right, I'm still recovering. We just spent 45 I... minutes talking to Robert Smith from The Cure, and he was chipper. Delightful. He was delightful. When when do you hear Robert Smith and delightful in the same <laughs> sentence? Seriously. That's what we deliver for you here on debate. What the oh. hell? It's, it, this has been a Listen, great couple of days here. Unbelievable. I mean, wow. we went into this with like... Cure 30th anniversary, uh, disintegration anniversary, we'll do a roundtable about that, which then was like, okay, we'll do a top five new, new wave, wave because of that. Biggest top five we've ever done in our history. And then things like, oh, do you want Johnny Marr to come by? Oh, hmm. Robert Smith, I email saying I want to talk to you guys because I, I heard that and had some things I wanted to say. It all just organically grew underneath us into a wild week. I want to know, that guy who called uh, earlier saying yesterday was maybe our best show. Yeah. I want to know if he's still saying that. Yeah. I hope you hung around <laughs> and caught this. This is, uh, I mean, we, we obviously mention on demand all the time. This, there was so much information in this interview, you need My to God. go back and listen to it again. I know I'm, I was here and I'm going to listen to it go again. go back and listen to it again about the new album, about- This festival the, in LA that he's curating. That they're going, that they are going to announce in two weeks, two weeks. but he's semi-announced. Um talking about a maybe a documentary or something that he would narrate as a history of mm -hmm. the cure um what what else was in there uh there's for, doing another song for the new album right the new album that there's that he has a run order that he loves but it's too, too sad. bleak and depressing <laughs> so he wants to mix it up a little that's a bad thing <laughs> since when is that a bad thing with the cure album uh, just too much and all the rock hall you know the thoughts on the on the rock hall on the induction on trent on being indecisive but then being very excited at having yeah. pulled the trigger and decided it and of course his thoughts on the uh the the interview clip <laughs> that we all saw. <laughs> Our friend Carrie. Oh. Carrie Keegan. Well, that's one way to go viral, <laughs> I suppose. Too much. What Too a much. day it wow. has been. Uh, I hope you were around for all of it.